seen the afternoon and I'll see you when I finish the draft on on six or eight because I I'm waiting on that. I've got to go do the reading. I've got to finish this thing. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. I check table clock for you as the listener. About a billion billions of keys at the door. Wait and see the fate. Wait care to see the fate. Your daughter is chatting in sleep. Set your room table clock. Set your room table clock. Wait and set your closet. Wait and set your closet. Midnight. Preferably at midnight. Of the weekend. When the kids sleep. Beside the door, two things can be found. Yes, and then a little worry. Valentine's Day. Is the Valentine's Day dress unexpectedly without its place? Wait care to know. Midnight. When your daughter is chatting in sleep. Midnight. Set your room table clock. Oh, wait and see. The Valentine's dress is small, soft, and creamy. Is it made of green grass? Well, it's changed by the weather. Is it made of green grass? Under it's changed by the weather. The pattern on the umbrella. The sound of water. White as any boot. Of the weekend when the kids sleep. Wait and see. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My breath takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it takes place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell, words when that's possible in the future. At present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound. It's kind of a, a hierarchy which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the tone, the sonic, the visual, and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres, such as you know printed text where things don't move around. But electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts, how we perceive the world and ourselves, and trying to portray that using computation, using the specific processes that are unique to computers. There are two main literary parents for me, for the fiction, and one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow, which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation. Uh, there are there are no there are no visible artworks, but there is a tremendous reference to the language of of art and film and music and theater and that was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to um, alter the state of writing it's it's literature that engages its digitality I remember sitting in my office and, and Jeff finished the Mary Collins on Thinking Hat. Oh my God, this used to be how to read this thing. Prepared to produce non quest in the glass the sake, door. These certain methods, very clean if there is no seen variety, very, very clean small if there bridge, is no pleasure, overly moist pre Prepared, sugar is not a volume. Not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness related to the vulture. And shape, however, in varying sides and the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, to use, last, they open, are double, for the sake, and rapid exploration requires most mutilated classes, while the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal. Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is 
can be considered practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media, as Amrit said, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint, if anyone knows what that is. It's just like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text, the graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read. And the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw in camera works, um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, and by the art space of San Jose State that Stephen Muir, Moore curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between visual arts and halfway between writing. And of course, performance art also that I was associated with, and the artist books. So those were uh, interests that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine-enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional print or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines and they don't exist uh, in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raising the dirt, only several colors, haul the one cluster away, variety each a method, package of seeds, distance, the several knocking blows. Smooth, location tip it down, magnify the bottom, darting in the habitual shadow, seen bending. We're all moving toward storytelling in digital space, and some of the most interesting experiments that are happening are in um, electronic literature. You're coming out of a, a Dadaist tradition uh, of saying there is there's something beyond this, and and I'm I'm going to rearrange this stuff and and find other layers beyond the visible, or make other layers. I think electronic literature is digital-born literature that would not exist otherwise than by mediation through a computer. Electronic literature is the exploration of how we can tell stories with the augmentation uh, of technology, so what technology makes possible in our storytelling palette, and particularly thinking about kind of the networked and connective tissues of literature and storytelling and the ways that we realize those through the technologies we already use all the time, particularly on the web. The lack of clear signal rules has been an attempt to vex you, and a rather an invitation to read either inquisitively or playfully and, playfully and also object. This kind of work would interest you and invite you. Electronic literature can be a number of things. It, it's interactive. It has to do with words and images. I go in and out of what to call myself. I still say different things. So within the community, I create electronic literature, yeah. which, which I would call poetic narrative. So I'm a poet who works with narrative. I, I think the day that comes that we don't actually d distinguish it as electronic literature is the day that, that uh, we finally, uh, well, I, would be the day that, well, we don't have to ask questions like that again. Ah, uh, an otherworldly glass of beer. Up here, uh, the black but wouldn't you like an otherworldly uh, glass of beer? But wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? Up here, bushes, just beside the trail as you crest the hill, amber-colored beer in a tall crystal glass, quite, quite fallen on Diana's eyes. The smell of hops and honey, a golden ice box. Ah, uh, but wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? The sound of water, white-capped mountains, 
Amber covers the sound and the talk with the white flats. capped mouth. Cold water. Amber covers the beard white and the talk by the down sides. Cold water. Deep down to the water, the smell of hops and honey. The daily in and out flow of the bean bites. The daily the smell in and out green flow grass. of the bean bites. The world stones the smell by the river of green grass. Correct. It is word, image, sound, moving image, touch, bits, mind, body, heart. To be linked to the chain of existence and events, yes, but bound by it, no. I forge my own links. I'm building my own monstrous chain. And as time goes on, perhaps it will begin to resemble, rather, a web. Primarily artistic work that has a strong emphasis in the literary, but cannot be divorced from its medium, which is digital, and so uh, you can't print it. It's not like an ebook. One of the challenges I had set for me for this text was to try to write a novel that no 20th century writer could write. And the only way to do that is obviously to try to push the text itself beyond what it's possible. To possible to do. So including projective at things like the oracle, including a burrower that literally takes the text and reconfigures it in ways that cannot be predicted. And that, I think, is you know, what Burroughs is getting at. It's that um, the, the, the text itself can be exploded and that when you take those pieces and reassemble them, something new can come out that you did not even put there, that you did not know was there. Um, and that is what makes it, a, a, that pushes it beyond what you can, you as a writer can possibly do. I guess I would say that electronic literature is reading, um, and it could be it could be symbols, it could be icons, um, through some sort of electronic means. It could be digital. It could be analog electricity. And so something I would say interactive would be maybe a, a key word, but not necessarily um, kinetic. Perhaps a couple of things, but I feel like it's such a broad thing. It's hard to just define. I think you you just gotta be be open. To what's out there. Hypertext, to put it clearly, is a mapping of a text onto a four dimensional space. Normal grammars then do not apply and become branching structures anew. Fragments, branches, links. The word is glowing and on a screen. It is electronic and cannot be touched. It has been copied over thousands of times and reverberates through virtual space. The text coils in on itself. It is a topographic map of the air currents in the upper atmosphere, those sudden winds that change direction, inexplicable. The reader becomes a sort of satellite taking photographs of a huge and varied terrain. The reader can see the whole world or zoom in to see a particular ant on the banks of the sun. The ant has six legs. The reader is staring at a video screen. How then to turn the page? To me, electronic literature is any kind of uh, literary practice that does not depend on the printed page, but may include the printed page. Remember, I have to remember, you have to remember, that, that um, I wrote this entire text in the machine, and so I was always its first reader, and I was discovering the way it was changed in there. There was never a flow chart, there was never any, any, any set of text to say, say the way through, so I was pursuing kinds of texture too. There are a lot of electronic literature classes, but how many are actually teaching students the range of what they can do in the field? How many new student writers are we producing? We are producing some, but not enough. It was one of my central theses in Patchwork Girl that there is no central thesis, <laughs> that there is no center, that there is no self, there is only a temporary and contingent coming to contingent coming together of influences and borrowed pieces that could as easily have come together in another form mm -hmm. and will come together in another form, that the desire to make oneself 
coherent and permanent is a doomed one, but not only doomed, also an unhealthy one, that part of our job is to learn to let go <laughs> of ourselves. And literature is one of the ways we learn to let go of ourselves, let learn to release ourselves into the stream of other people's thoughts and visions and to enjoy that alienation from our own monotonous dream of consciousness. And I think literature is this the use of language to sort of disrupt the its in instrumental applications, right? So um, the question of electronic literature then is how, do, how are people working in the uh, digital vernacular or the in emerging sort of media landscape to um, estrange people from the, the conventional codes that, that try to organize human behavior and to create an occasion for something uh, otherwise. We look now at how simple it is to create immersive, full-res images, and we just did not have that technology. So I am, I am very happy with the narrative premise, and I'm very happy with the way I executed, given the constraints, but I, I would really wish I could fix some of those pictures. Electronic literature is anything that you can't do in a linear print, and electronic is the wrong word here. It's anything that stretches text beyond... composing a culture with one work upon another. The Pathfinders Project is a preservation project that aims to make electronic literature available for generations beyond us. This project is very important because if you think about it, early digital literature represents a cultural moment and a historical change in the way we think about literature. In Pathfinders, we used a concept called traversal, a way of capturing author and user interactions on the work's original platform. I wanted the reader to feel that there were distinctly different human stories. This is fundamentally embodied. Somebody told me it was their bedtime story every day, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and I also found telling the story that way appealed to the social media nature of, of the audience. We think this method of preservation in conjunction with things like migration and emulation will keep crucial works alive so that future readers can better understand them. Without a doubt, we have the potential to transform the field of digital media preservation. This multimedia book is just the beginning. Welcome to the third of seven live stream traversal broadcasts from the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Dini Grigar, the director of the lab and professor of the Creative Media and Digital Culture program here at the university. Today we're live streaming a traversal of Jay Yellowleaf Douglas's I Have Said Nothing. This event is part of the Born Digital Preservation Series celebrating the electronic literature organization's move from MIT to WSUV. It's sponsored by WSUV the WSU Lewis and Lewis E. and Stella G. Buchanan Distinguished Professorship and the Electronic Literature Organization. In the online audience today, we have several people. I want to thank you for being there. First, the author, Jay Yellowlees Douglas, is with us. So thank you, Jane, for being here. Kathy Emmon Barons. I also have seen some other folks from the program online. So thank you for being here. In the audience here in the room, we have John Barber and Will Lures, who are both faculty in the program, as well as many of our students. Um, as I've mentioned in the previous two traversals, a traversal is a process that was developed for the Pathfinders Project by Stuart and me. It's defined as an audio and video recording of a demonstration 
performance um, that's taken place in a historically appropriate platform by an author and or a reader of the work. The Pathfinder's methodology was created for preserving interactive and media-rich works that cannot be captured in print. It also includes, along with the traversal, many other components, like an interview, like images of the work itself, um, detailed discussions about the, the history of the work. It also includes sound files and essays, the bio of the author, and information about the provenance of the work itself. Today we're live streaming this traversal as well as videotaping it so that it can be um, contained in a multimedia book that will be produced at the end of the seven traversals. Um, we're collecting all of this data and uh, the book will be available for free on the Scalar platform. Assisting today is Nicholas Schiller. He's the Associate Director of this lab. Greg Philbrook is the Instructional and Techn Technical Support Specialist for my program. Um, with us also are the undergraduate researchers and those include Veronica Whitney, who's the L Catalog Content Specialist, Mariah Gwynn, who's a Research Game Specialist, and also Katie Bowen, who's an ELIT Specialist for Documentation. Today, I'm, um, we're, we're, all, we're um, featuring one of our colleagues who is an L affiliate with, um, with us, and that is Dr. Philippe Braun. He is with the World Literatures Department at uh, Lewis and Clark College. I met him at the uh, DHSI event about two summers ago, I believe, when he was taking a course in electronic literature. The link to this uh, live stream will be available at the L website, which we will be posting on Facebook and Twitter. And our Facebook channel and Twitter ha uh, hashtag are both ELIT Pathfinders. So thank you very much. Great, so hello, my name is Philippe Brand. Um, so when uh, you kind of open up the box, uh, this is the box of J. Yellow Lee's Douglas, I Have Said Nothing, um, which is also uh, paired with another text uh, named Lust by Mary Kim Arnold. So uh, when you open up the box, there's a, uh, an ad for story space on the right and on the left, uh, the East Gate, and then opened up and there's just a little floppy disk which may be familiar to many of us um, and not familiar to some others. So we're performing this traversal today on uh, a Macintosh performer. Uh, when you, the first thing you see once the disk is loaded is just kind of a standard little uh, desktop icon like that. I'm just clicking on it and we're going to go ahead and uh, begin a new reading here. It takes just a moment to load and then uh, we can see there there are two um, kind of overlapping boxes here. Uh, the first has the main text um, with kind of a title page and then behind it there is uh, you can see kind of a, a map of all the different nodes. So we'll start from the start. So I'm clicking um, just on the on the title here. I have said nothing, and it's giving me here just a choice of two options to to begin. Um, the first one on, on the top says what question mark Do you remember Sherry question mark And then below that there's which at Christmas. We'll start with the top one. Clicking follow. So the the first part of the text reads Do you remember Sherry Remember Sherry my brother Luke's piece, the one who got into that god-awful tango with him at Paychecks in Hamtrak, the one who threw that half-empty bottle of beef eater gin at his head when he told her to stop drinking, the one who folded up like an old coat and skidded, flapping down the length of the basement wall when he elbowed her square in the solar plexus. Hell, you remember Sherry, I'm sure. The thing is, she's dead. So um, here as a, as a professor of literature, I have to say we already have a uh, sex and violence, which are the, kind of the two main narrative, uh, motors of narrative interest um, since time immemorial. So I'll click on dead. Bound to happen is the title. Shit, it was bound to happen, I suppose. Too much gin, too many viverin. Remember how we used to eat those getting ready for exams? And the belief that nothing can touch you. The cars will always scream towards you like, like something out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. But they'll stop like that too. 
the cowcatcher of the locomotive quivering just inches away from Bugs Bunny and the whole nine yards. I guess she, she thought Warner Brothers took their ideas from life, or life took its ideas from Warner's. C'est la même chose. I'll click on the French word, which is bringing us back to that, uh, back to the English. All it took. Actually, it took a hell of a lot, if you ask me. It took about four quarts of Beefeater gin, as well as a handful of Black Beauties, not to mention incredibly bad timing and six inch spike heels. So when I clicked on heels, it's taking us all of a sudden to a very, um, you know, what seems like a very different part of the narrative. Uh, the title of this little box is Anatomy. Do you know what happens to you when a Chevy Nova with a 280 engine hits you going 75 miles an hour? I'm gonna click on Nova and see what happens. Uh, and so then we have a list. Uh, anatomized, it fractures your collarbone, your scapula, your pelvis, your sacral, lumbar, thoracic, and cervical vertebrae. It splinters your rib cage, compressing your liver, kidneys, spleen, stomach, intestines, lungs, and heart. It fractures your skull and bruises your brain. It causes massive hemorrhaging, throws the heart into cardiac arrest, and hurls your central nervous system into profound shock. I'm going to click on shock. It's a shocking moment, obviously, in the narrative where we've gone from um, just kind of getting the background context uh, of the story into this very kind of uh, violent description of the of the car crash. Everyone, it breaks every bone in your body, and there's a long uh, white space there, including your head. I'll click on body, and then ellipsis nothing. So I'll click on nothing. Um, but this isn't all. The guys with the EMS stand looking down at her. One of them nudges her with the tip of his high tops. Her right arm flaps slightly, the way blow-up dolls might. Shit, she's dead, he says. How do we define death? I'll click on death. Um, we could say, all cessation of cardiac activity, no evidence of any brain activity. I'll click on evidence. We could also say, but that's not really the cause of her death. We could be clinical and insist that it's hypoxia. Her cells get starved of oxygen, and they die in shoals, granted. But that means she dies piecemeal, perception gradually getting snuffed out sense by sense. Or it gets distorted, so she thinks. She's flying towards a bright light, and all those other things doctors tell you are simply the reactions of a brain starved of oxygen, and not someone experiencing death in the liberation of her soul. Um, it's kind of interesting, just as a, a little side note as a reader, too, uh, to see this this kind of emphasis on like the little uh, like the brain cells being starved of oxygen oxygen and they're kind of like dying in little in little fragments. Um, you know, this is obviously a very fragmented text. Uh, if you look at at one of the nodes, um, and I'm not sure how to zoom out here. You can kind of uh, you can maneuver the mouse a little bit uh, down here, and it's kind of maneuvering. Uh, through all the different nodes, but it's a very, it's a very complex, um, you know, kind of network of nodes, as you can see. Uh, and it's not, uh, you can see right here, um, we could also say, so it's highlighted right there. And I'm not sure, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and click on one and then see, like, where it takes us to, because I'm not sure um, whether we're following this, like, in a completely linear fashion or whether we're kind of jumping. Um, from Luxia to Alexia. So I'll click on Soul and see where that takes us. If that's so. If that's so, then I hope she didn't hear them. And so there it does look like we were right there. We could have also, I think, or you could have also. And we went right there. So it looks like it was a fairly um, direct uh, narrative progression right there. And in this case, you can, you can tell that the the narrative is progressing fairly linearly when they were just describing that the the girlfriend was was in the process of dying and perhaps she still retained some degree of consciousness and so then it leads to if that's so i hope she didn't hear them so i'll click on she and see what that takes us in the ambulance they're in the ambulance heading toward the hospital its siren and lights are on and it's pushing the speed limit full whack the EMS guys know she's dead, but they're in a rush to get off their shift and back to the hospital, so they put them on. Technically, since she's a DOA, 
this thing should be going like a hearse through streets still dark with sleep. Inside, the sound of everything, the sirens, the medics, the steady hiss of the snow tires against the wet tarmac, everything, is drowned out by the sound of blood running from her ears, just like water running under a sluice. I'll click on ears. So here all of a sudden it's taken me to um, a blank, the, the main screen is blank right here, and there's a little dot um, right in the middle. I'm looking at the, uh, at the map underneath. You can kind of see, I believe, we were kind of going through this box, dyslexia, down to this one, down to this one, and now we're here. So I'm not sure what'll happen, so stay tuned. Um, I'll, I'll click return, and uh, we got the end. That's all she wrote. And uh, click on this one. Ah, it's beeping at me. Click on that one. Also beeping. And so I'll hit return again. I think this is presumably the, the end of this narrative thread. Um, yes, it is. So I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go back. I'll go ahead and quit quit reading. And we'll just go ahead and, and start it again. So it's asking me, do you wish to save? The current place uh, in your reading of this text and since it seems like we hit the end we'll just click on no and we'll start it over so and here we'll go with begin a new reading luckily that was very quickly <laughs> i wasn't sure how long it would take to, <laughs> to learn but happily uh this this little computer has got enough uh, firepower to keep us going Okay, so um, if you remember at the beginning, they gave us two uh, kind of a, a, an initial fork um, that we could take. So I'll take the other one, which begins which at Christmas. So this one, uh, this thread begins over Christmas. You're while you're staying at New York in a hotel on the Upper West Side, you drop by to change your clothes late one afternoon and happen to notice that the message light next to the phone is blinking. You go into the voicemail system and play back the message recorded in your sister-in-law's scratchy voice. It tells you another one of your brother's girlfriends has been killed. So I think for me reading this, all of a sudden it kind of, uh, the another one really pops out and, and makes you wonder like, okay, wait, who, you know, who was the initial person who was, it seemed clear that it was your brother's girlfriend before, although I'm not even 100% sure if I caught her name. Um, and so now another one, I kind of, you know, as a reader, immediately like, wait, what's going on here? So I clicked on another. Um, and the title up here is why. When I call him after the accident, we're talking about the second accident now. So there's, you know, some kind of narrative uh, indices here to kind of tell us which, which thread we're, we're in. Um, neither of us has any words to pass back and forth over the phone. Finally, he just says, why? And period, there's no question mark. Um, it's not even a question, which is good because I don't have any answers for him. I could say something lame about people wasting their lives trying to make things matter, or how we spend our days mistaking patterns for order, but I say nothing. Um, it's an interesting sentence right there, how we spend our days mistaking patterns for order. Um, you know, I think particularly here where we're not sure as a reader, like, it, it, you know, are we following this uh, this narrative through kind of a predetermined sequence, or do we have kind of uh, relative liberty to kind of explore the different nodes in 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 whatever order we we perceive? And so I think it's kind of an interesting little mini meta commentary upon our uh, our action as a reader when we're approaching this this narrative. Um, you know, are we are we finding patterns? Uh, are we mistaking patterns? Kind of what's what's going on? But I say nothing. I'll click on nothing. Then brings us to another question. What? For a long time afterwards, whenever you two don't quite meet up on the phone, he can't seem to get the narrative order of events quite right. He, he, he keeps shuffling it around until you realize neither of you know what it was anymore. One day he tells you that Jewel berated the EMS guys all the way to the UCLA Medical Center. There doesn't seem to be any point in reminding him that yesterday, he told you the police broke all the gory details to him about seven or eight hours after the accident, or that the day before he said they'd both been drinking. What he says is this, and there's uh, um, a colon, I want to see what, what comes next, but, um, you know, kind of just to, uh, to come back to this again, you know, this notion of even the brother, even the character can't seem to get the narrative order of events quite right. Um, 
actually makes me want to click here. I'm curious to see like, oh, that's interesting. Actually, if, if you can kind of see, it looks like this is kind of its own little um, little Lexia, this little box is kind of way off to the side and it looks like there are kind of different um, connecting threads that are connecting it to the other to other nodes. Or actually, this is kind of a connecting node that is connecting to other little um, Lexia here. So it's interesting to kind of, it, it would, I would assume that when you're navigating through this narrative that there are many different ways to end up uh, arriving at this specific, um, this specific part of the narrative, which is, like I said, kind of calling into question, like, can anyone keep, get the narrative order of events quite right? Here. And so, in some ways, you know, this this idea of he keeps shuffling it around until you realize neither of you know what it was anymore. I think that's very, for for me at least as a reader, very um, telling in terms of you know you're trying to kind of reconstruct this narrative through these different uh, fragmented segments, and it's very it's very unclear. Kind of you know, do do I understand exactly what's going on? So what he says is this: I'm gonna click on the this and see if that takes us to a, a sequential part of it. So the title up here is Drew. And it looks like looking at the, um, here we, we it looked like it just shot us up. There's a little arrow right there, if you can kind of see it. We jump from there up to there. Um, so Drew, do you remember old Drew in Deliverance? He says to you, it's an old movie haven't seen it if you're young. Uh, Sherry and I used to think it was real gross, the way the way that John Voight kissed Drew before he pushed the body under. Kissing a dead guy like that. You don't need to answer him. Just let him keep going. Man, that's what I did. In the morgue. I kissed her everywhere. Everything. I even kissed her little box. There was a social worker in the room and all, and I just didn't care. She wasn't a dead body. He starts to cry once again. Anything else he had to convey to you is lost. So I'm going to click on lost. Um, you wonder, uh, did she know? Did she have some faint nudge between the ribs, some vague tickle that life's silent partner was going to call in his debts that afternoon? Or was it just a coincidence? Like Sherry saying to the old lady a few weeks before the accident, when I die, it's going to be fast. Like I didn't know what hit me. Um, you can kind of see, so we jumped from what um, up to... Uh, that's quite a bit higher up there. I think we jumped from what up to this one up here, maybe. Uh, Drew actually kind of lost where where it was, um, and then jumping down. So uh, it'll be an interesting question if hopefully the author is here later to kind of um, to ask about you know kind of in what. Is, is, are we following kind of like a predetermined narrative thread or did we are we kind of just jumping around? Um, I'm going to click on me. You never saw. Remember how they, how they say that? He never knew what hit him. The old lady almost, always said it almost triumphantly as if she were somehow one up on the unfortunate parties under discussion by knowing what had hit them in the end. Maybe she was right. The way you figured it, not knowing what hit you, put you in a position not only of utter helplessness, but of absolute ignorance. An acquaintance of mine once told me about a friend of his who died in that accident involving the inbound L-1011 uh, in Woodshire at Dallas-Fort Worth. I imagine her talking about her grandchildren to her seatmate, looking out the window, getting all excited about seeing Dallas, he said. She was like an insect before it gets swatted. It was kind of interesting here. Just how the narrative seems to be ramifying into other other tales of, of, of death and, and people kind of trying to make sense uh, afterwards. There's um there was a text actually I should have uh, mentioned this when I when I opened it up, but I uh, it was uh, I believe it was included in mm -hmm. yeah it was it was included in the uh, in the original packaging, um, and it's. Uh, It's got several um, several essays. First of all, it has sorry I didn't mention this before. It has um, installation uh, uh, instructions here, and then an ad for another another narrative. 
Um, and then there's a foreword by uh, J. Yellowies Douglas, herself. And then there's uh, an essay entitled Introductory Remarks, uh, The Crash of Nothing into Something uh, by Stuart Moulthrop. And uh, in this essay, he mentions the uh, kind of the recurring theme of car crashes uh, occurring in, in hypertext literature. And he mentions there's a very kind of interesting line here, um, this feeling of, of uh, as Moulthrop says, uh, the crash has been and gone, consider the debris. And I think that's very, uh, very evocative of the experience here. Like this is, as, as the reader, this is always kind of after the crash and we're trying to work through in some ways like the debris of the narrative and figure out, okay, well, what, you know, there's all these kind of fragmented pieces, what, uh, what's happened here, you know, and how can we reconstruct what's going on? And in some ways, I think that this, um, is interesting to look at, you know, kind of this very uh, visual representation of all the different narrative fragments. And you can imagine, um, it's interesting as a reader to kind of imagine like, okay, how did the, how did the author conceive uh, of all these different narrative sec sections or fragments fitting together? And, uh, you know, and it kind of really calls into question, like, is there is there a way that this is, you know, that, that you could imagine, would there be like one perfect linear reading where everything kind of perfectly falls into place? Or are we always kind of condemned to, uh, to s kind of sort our way through the fragments and figure out, okay, what, what, you know, what, what happened here? And of course, with the, um, I mean, the notion of car crash and the victim's bodies too, is there's, there, um, I was clicking around before and there was, if you remember, there was the, um, the list of all the different body parts that were kind of um i'm not sure if i'll be able to find it again but they describe you know like all the different vertebrae and the different organs and whatnot and that you could you know it's a very kind of literal uh way of kind of you know listing all the different body parts that were all broken and that were all fragmented as a result of this car crash so there are a lot of kind of interesting um echoes between content and form here as we're navigating through here so here we are. Would you choose the same? I'll click on choose since it seems appropriate. Um, nope. It all depends, I guess, on whether you choose to spend your last second as a conscious being mulling over something completely banal or if to spend it with your eyes trained on the death express as it hurtles towards you at half the speed of light. Personally, I'd opt for the banal approach. Um, I'll click on personally. You realize there are loads of things that you never knew, you never knew. It just happens that you can't communicate any of them. Well, I'll click on communicate. Actually, I'm curious. I'm going to see really quickly where we are. Um, so here we are. There's a little uh, you realize right there on this box. So I'm going to click on uh, communicate and see where it takes us. Um, later. Later he would come back looking for some things. The diamond earrings that she'd been wearing when they set out that night, but which never quite made it to the morgue. The octagon of skin she left against one curb is opaque and delicate as a fragment of ice skimmed from the surface of a pond, not yet frozen over. Um, and here, I mean, this notion of kind of going back and looking for fragments or looking for this, you know, the diamond earrings. I think you could think about narrative fragments, but also kind of a trace. It seems like the the brother is really interested in kind of trying to trying to find some sort of physical or tangible trace of um, his his dead girlfriend that will help help make sense. Um, and so up here we're in later, and I'm not actually not quite sure where we uh, where we were before, but it looks like we kind of got transported <laughs> um, quite a ways from from the previous Lexi to this one. Okay, so I'll click on skin. Um, later still, he'd come back looking for something else. When the moment was right, he stepped off the curb where he'd sat holding her feet the Saturday before. Click on feet. Um, so this looks like it's taken us actually, that's all of a sudden we just uh, popped right to the end again. Um, so there was a later right there, and I think we clicked to later still. And then all of a, all of a sudden we just got to this um, this one, which I believe is the end. I'll click enter just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure it's going to tell us that's all she wrote. So I'll go back and I'll, uh, I'll restart it again. Uh, we're not going to save our place. Okay. The 
taking any reading. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go back and uh, and and continue with the one that we were just. Uh, or I'll go back to the first of the two threads actually, which is entitled "What do you remember, Sherry?" Um, and so here, I guess we did we did learn her name right from the start. Sherry's who is the first um, the first of the girlfriends to die. And I'm gonna go through and just to kind of see like what what can we what can we find you know is there a way that um, Sherry's story will 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 kind of tie us in with the other uh, uh, with the second girlfriend and see like okay you know like where is at what point do these two narratives kind of meet? Okay, so it's interesting. I clicked on um, this is actually a, a screen that we saw before. I clicked on Luke and it, and it's taking us back to a screen that we saw originally. Uh, in the f very first uh, reading, which is shit, it was bound to happen, I suppose. Too much gin, too much vibrin. Um, and so, kind of as a reader, it's interesting to think like, okay, I'm, my first reaction was like, oh, I've read this before. I want to find something new. I want to find out what else happened. But in some ways, when you're kind of thinking that this is a text about trauma, um, which, of course, for many people is, is the reliving of, of, of certain memories and reliving of events. So it's actually kind of, it's, it's, in some ways kind of fascinating that just like the characters are maybe kind of you know just uh you know just kind of being tormented and going over and over the same memories over and over again perhaps that could be one of the potential readings that that you could have as a reader you're kind of following these people around through the circularity of of these traumatic memories so i'm going to click on the uh on one of the nodes here and just see if i can there's one called faint surprise which Sounds interesting, so I'll click on that one. Okay, here we go. Um, faint surprise, hardcore drinking problem, seriously insecure, Mondo Bucks. That was Sherry, all right. Uh, when I go, she used to say, I want it to be fast. It sure as fuck was, as far as we know. Luke said when he saw her face, there was only a faint expression of surprise on it. She was a major baby about pain. Uh, she was a major baby about pain. I wasn't there, so it's hard for me to imagine what that must have looked like. You can say that faint expressions of anything weren't an overly familiar component of her particular repertoire. So I'm uh, curious. I wonder. I'm just gonna click on. Uh, I'm gonna click on Bucks just to see if it if it's taking us somewhere nearby. And we're we're right here. I'm curious to see if it's gonna lead us just right on there. Um. No, it looks like we jumped a couple. So we were up at faint surprise before, and now it looks like we jumped down to this one, which is um, he was holding. Um, so he was holding her feet because the December night outside was freezing, literally. That was what had made her scamper across Telegraph's road, lethal arteries after all. Luke knelt down at the curb and collected her into his lap. When the Detroit police found him, he was cradling her bare feet between his palms. The shoes had been knocked from her feet, he explained in quite a level voice and he couldn't find them anymore. But she'd always hated the cold. She was quite a baby about it, in fact. Um, and in these readings right now, I think this is actually the first uh, moment that I remember where we're seeing Detroit here. Uh, in one of the previous readings, I, I believe that the second girlfriend, uh, they mentioned the UCLA uh, hospital. So we've got, I think these are the kind of the first that I remember at least kind of indicators of where the setting is. Uh, I'm going to click on baby. He took home artifacts. He took home artifacts. The soiled underpants ornamented with nylon lace, the pair of sparkly blue socks she was wearing, a barrette that had been knocked into the gutter. He wasn't even sure if it was hers or not. He slept with this collection heaped under his pillow, along with one of the pair of spike heels she'd been wearing, a six-inch number, which may or may not have been responsible for the accident. Um... And so I think we're, uh, we're, we're pretty close to the time here, so we'll probably just uh, knock off there, but I think we're going to open it up for the Q&A. No. Yeah. 
All right, so um, we have time, lots of time for questions. And we have folks online um, that might want to uh, post a few questions. And if some folks have posted them on Facebook and Twitter, just let us know and we'll feed them into the chat. So any questions from folks online or in the room? I'm curious as to what Jane um, wrote the story on, because I know she wrote it in the UK, so and those aren't necessarily portable. Okay. Jane, um, did you see did you hear that question? What were you using to write this on? I know you we talked about this last night. Do you want to um, say something online about this and I'll read it? as you write it. She says she wrote this on a Mac portable. I think you said that Stuart called it a luggable. Is that correct? Because <laughs> <laughs> they were so big and heavy. Yeah. So those were brown. I think we might remember those were mm. kind of the big giant brown ones. They were not that portable. So um, I think they weighed about I want to say about 12, 10 to 12 pounds. So they were definitely not that portable. Other questions? Yeah. I think I will have a question. Will has a question. The cognitive map that Jane talks about, about the ECG, looking at the different uh, lexia and how they relate, I think is important, from my understanding, is important for her, I guess. Was it confusing because of the jumbled nature? <laughs> Was it confusing to make that map work the way she, I think, intended to see the larger picture, or did it seem clear? Yeah, I mean, I think just, I and mean, as a user on this particular computer, it was it was just unclear. Like, I mean, you couldn't really, I couldn't really find a way to like zoom in and out, <laughs> even kind of something as, as basic as that. So I could kind of scroll through and explore different parts of it, but I, I felt like I was never able to kind of zoom out far enough where I, I felt like, okay, I see the overarching uh, structure of it. So Jane yeah. says that it was confusing because you couldn't see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we may want to reach over yeah. and see if we yeah. can make that screen bigger. Yeah. And we can zoom out. Um, we're having trouble zooming out on this, on this particular computer. Yeah, I would say one of the problems we're having. Oh, well, we got somewhere close. There's <laughs> another reading. Um, there's three different ways to read a, hyper, a story space hypertext. That's one of them. But it's really hard to get this to... Um, she said the ground zero, so to speak, the narrative is a spot where the two deaths converge. So originally this was meant to be like two pyramids, and the middle was the ground zero piece, where the two deaths converge. And you can't see it on this computer monitor. I think that um, I noticed when I was uh, when I was when I was uh, looking at this uh, when I was when I was doing a lot of research before that there's a, there's like an emulation of uh, of this text um, on the Norton website. I believe it was anthologized, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there's um, you can kind of navigate uh, a, a, like some excerpts of it, and there there is. The, an image of this, uh, of all the nodes that, that I think does show kind mm -hmm. of the yeah, like recency. Yeah, where it's yeah. like, like um, yeah, like yeah. that, like those butterflies, yeah. right? Yeah. So as Bailey, Bailey Anderson uh, says, if it wasn't possible to zoom out, I think it would be overwhelming to try and make sure you read everything. Bailey, the yeah. answer to that is you can't read everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the point. It's, that's one of the major kind of features of the hypertext literature that we were playing with in those in that period is you can't read everything. Jane responds, I accidentally discovered the power of this map when I had to give a talk at Imperial College to their software engineering department. I've been playing with mapping. So she, and I, if you remember correctly, we've done traversals of Shelley Jackson's Pegfoot Girl, which uses the body, the monster body, as the cognitive map. And Uncle Buddy Phantom Funhouse uses the house as the cognitive map. So we had to, a lot of these authors were coming up with ideas for how to structure their, their material, right? The nodes, the paths, the links, so that it had some, some kind of conceptual framework. And so with this, it was that, that pyramid with the center, with the two deaths. 
I have a question for the for the author actually. I mean, is it does um does the the structure does that structure um like play with both space and time? You know. Okay, like so that's a great question. Um, Yellow Lee's um, belief was asking, did, did your structure play with both space and time? She's writing right now that she was influenced by Kevin Lynch's The Image of a City, and she says yes. Okay. Yes. And Kathy Barron mentions that she thinks the shapes are um, it's very much like concrete poetry, and I think in, in a way, mm. yes, absolutely. Other questions? Henry. Um, how many paths are there exactly, do you know? How many paths are there uh, exactly? So I we counted 206 links and uh, 96 spaces. So um, I'm guessing the paths are about 200 plus, right? Because you have to go from place to place, hyperlinking. It's a lot. And if you make twine work, she noticed yeah. that you're having to you know, create that same structure. This so this uh, this software is actually easier than Twine. Um, I have it on these computers, so if you want to come up and play with it and experience it, you should, because you can just drop a box easily and then just draw the lines, whereas in Twine, it's a little bit more arduous, especially Twine 2, which I find a little bit more persnickety. So, um, yeah. Other questions? I'd like to mention something, Jane, if you don't mind, that we were talking last night, that this is based on your on your own life. You are the narrator, narrator of the story. Your brother, Mark, is Luke, and you chose the name Mark because you wanted to stay with the apostle name, and, he, and Luke and Mark. And then um, he did lose his first girlfriend in a, a car crash, and the second one also was in a car crash, but she lived through it. So Jane took some liberties with that story and both characters died so Jules Jules died as well as um, Sherry but it's based on her own life I mean it felt like a very powerful reading experience I mean not even knowing that a, that there is a degree of autobiographical um, content to it you know I mean it, it didn't feel like oh this is just kind of a Maybe. interesting hook for like a choose your own adventure yeah. story and i mean it definitely felt like there was really um it was very beautifully written first of all like uh just in the prose style but i think that it definitely felt like there really was like a, a strong core of uh of, of of meaning and feeling so this work all the works in that we're doing um in this traversal series are also chosen for the uh, wikipedia thon mm. and will has been working on the Wikipedia entry for Jane uh, Yellow Leaf Douglas and for I Have Been Nothing. So I think we'll, according to Yellow Leaf, you've documented this story in your Wikipedia page. Is that true? Do what do you mean documented? The, the fact that this story uh, is like her life. It comes from her life yes, experience. Yes, yeah. I think that yes, that is. So that is documented. So Kathy's asking, Jane, how is authoring modified autobiography? How was authoring modified autobiography different from authoring the thesis in story space? And Jane's saying, I had written the prose in some of the Lexia as early as seven years prior. Mm -hmm. She'd been thinking of that for quite a while. You know, not having been able to navigate through the whole, um, the whole text, I'm wondering if, if, the words, if the words of the title, I have said nothing ever, ever occur in the text because I mean it seems like there's actually a great deal that's been said you know so it's kind of an interesting tension between the I actually between did I tracked it down in my, my third reading last night I found the first use of the title in my reading the first time I suggested in the um, the why Lexia yeah. but I say nothing right quote unquote and this is the narrator's response to Luke's question about why two mm -hmm. girlfriends had died and then in the end you say nothing from line from zero, the Lexia called zero, the lines are the aughts. Mm -hmm. um, and then she cites St. Augustine erroneously when she says, I have done nothing but wish to speak. If I have spoken, I have not said what I wish to say. And this is from the Lexia, but I have said nothing. So I find it, I found three of them. I'm sure there might be more. You need to say something about St. Augustine. <laughs> yeah, St. Augustine. So um, I, we were talking about this last night. I'm, I'm a big fan of St. Augustine and um, I've read quite a bit of his work um, in graduate school. 
and I noticed that this was not cited correctly, and she <laughs> was saying that she was trying to look up the, um, the citation for this and can't find it, and I didn't have time last night because we were finished yeah. so late to do that, so I'm going to spend the weekend looking for where this might have come from, because yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I've never seen this citation before, so... Anyway, I wouldn't say it's mangled, Jane. Yeah. I would say it's probably a good uh, artistic <laughs> rendition of something <laughs> yeah, you probably said. Yeah. Yes, poetic yeah. license yeah. is allowed. <laughs> I mean, St. Saint, Saint Augustine is an interesting reference, of course. I mean, the, the confession, yeah, I mean, St. Augustine's known for the confessions. I mean, it's like the most, if you know nothing else about St. Augustine, you know about that. And so kind of this, this text, it feels... Uh, a confession. Yeah, confessional, yeah. you know, like in a, in a very modern sense of... of of the brother, you know, trying to come to terms, and, and then the, the sibling, um, you know, trying to make sense of it as well. Yeah, and I think, uh, Jane, did you hear that? So the idea that your work somewhat parallels the notion of the Augustinian confession, where the brother basically has to confess that there, I mean, there's alcohol involved in these car crashes, right? So we get these little bits and pieces of why these crashes may have occurred, and they're not, they're not really accidents. They're not mm. really accidents. Mm. When, when alcohol is involved, it's not that much of an mm. accident, right? Especially when you're reading mm. about four mm. bottles of gin yeah, and, yeah. you know, the excess of alcohol. So, Kathy Barron says, and the confession is also like Peter's uh, PO, uh, point of view in the afternoon in the afternoon story, which mm. is true, yeah. And I would say also, you mentioned Eric Lohr's earlier, um, I think his work as well, because I think there's, there's that aspect of it in... Um, Strange Rain. So. It's interesting to talk about the car crash because mm -hmm. they do show up so much in early Elix. Yeah, I was interested. I didn't, yeah, I'd like to go back and reread that, uh, that essay uh, now ha after having read it because, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there, he, there's another part. I'm kind of paraphrasing it. Um, sorry, Stuart. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, talking about kind of the, um, you also like the feeling of speed and there's kind of the, the like the kinetic feeling of, of being in a vehicle kind of hurtling towards something and I think that um, I mean especially during a performance where I'm kind of like trying to read relatively quickly and kind of trying to cl click through and see like okay what's where is this taking us where you know where are we going to go you kind of feel like okay there's um, you know the kind of the, the, a little bit of a tension between kind of the narrative desire to learn like what happened but then kind of also wondering like, oh, there's, I mean, here it is very, there's a very clear visual representation. Like the there's crash. so much I'm not seeing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like along the way, and you can see like, oh, there's all this other, you know, part of the narrative that I haven't explored yet. But then it's like, you kind of like hit something. And sometimes I mean, you hit like the end, you know, I got uh, to a couple of points when I was reading it and navigating through it. I felt like, oh, wait, the end, that's all she wrote. And I'm like, no, I know that's not <laughs> all she wrote. You know, like I can see there's like 50, you know, 200 other um, other parts of it. And also if you, yeah. the, the way that monitor has kind of scrunched up all of her wonderful structure, mm. it looks like a car crash. I mean, everything's yeah. crashed into each other, right? Yeah. There's that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of the things I want to have Jane talk about a little bit is her background, because she went from being an English department, an academic setting, to moving into an incredible career that spreads between, you know, te teaching in a medical school, teaching in so many different areas and um, working with startups and I mean Jane your background is phenomenal so do you want to say a few things about that and I'll read it as you type because it is a pretty amazing career that spans a long time oh Nicholas you found thank you Nicholas he found <laughs> the uh, Augustine reference it's D Doctrina Christiana 1.6.6 and is she quoting it correctly I am still working on that. He's working on that. He's <laughs> translating it. At least he's he found it. Yeah. Of course, Nicholas Wood, he's got a background, and this is he came from religious <laughs> studies. <Yeah. laughs> and um, <coughs> she says, could someone paraphrase it? <laughs> Leave it to the librarian. Yep, that's right. Thanks, Bailey. <laughs> that's true. So, um, Yellowleaf is saying the the through line was my interest in psycholinguistics and reading. So that's what got her here. And she's going to be, I'm sure it's going to, she's got such 
There's so much to say, and then it's going to be a while. And then Nicholas chimes in and says, this is a quote I found. I don't know which translation, and he's going to give it to us. She then says, I parlayed that into teaching in a college of medicine. So she was implored, I think, for this one, for this, um, this period. And it's not usual to go from an English department to a college of medicine. So you have to have some incredible chops mm -hmm. to do that. So this is amazing. She also writes, I was also in advertising and working for big biotech clients. Um, are there, has uh, Daniel Louise Douglas written other uh, hypertext stories? No, but she's written, uh -uh. the book that she's, the physical book she's known uh -huh. for is End of Books or The Book Without End. Uh -huh. And that's a very famous uh -huh. kind of seminal uh -huh. piece that um, came out, I want to say 95. Will, do you remember the date of End of Books in your research? Um, 2000. Thank you, yeah. Jane. Yeah. So then Jane what goes on to say, um, but I was also in advertising with bio biotech clients. And then she said, no, she didn't write anymore. Okay, yeah. But End of Books came out in 2000. Jane, we're happy to get this in document um, in this chat because Wikipedia expects us to have documentation to back up things we do in Wikipedia. And there's not a lot of information out there that's printed up that's not on a blog site. So this documentation that we're making right now with your comments and with the comments by Kathy and by Bailey and by all of us in the lab will be used for that kind of documentation we need um, to increase the the material in Wikipedia. So just know that. It's vital that we get this on, on tape and in writing in the chat space. Um, Nicholas has also tracked down this uh, quote, so here we go. He says, Have we spoken or announced anything worthy of God? Rather, I feel that I have done nothing but wish to speak. If I have spoken, I have not said what I wish to say. Whence do I know this, except because God is ineffable? For, let me turn it there, for, <coughs> for God, nothing, although nothing worthy must be spoken at him, has accepted the tribute of the human voice and wished us to take joy in praising him with our words. So you got, you kind of got, kind of got close there, Jane. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Any other questions? I guess, um, I have a question for the author. Um, kind of, what came first, like the narrative, like the text of the narrative or the structure? Is that when, when like, now that I know that there is kind of this very clearly defined, uh, uh, like, inverted py pyramid structure? Okay, so that's a good question. Let's see if she can respond to that. Yeah. We're in a little bit of a lag right now, according to my computer. Is anyone seeing a lag? Yeah. So we'll see. As we're waiting for Jane, um, Nicholas just posted another text. Oh, and then he says he can't post it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it was because of the lag issue that we're having. Well, she mentioned that she had um, been writing this seven years before. Mm -hmm. yeah, so so um, that probably that has that probably influenced, and then it, then the idea that she came across this. A cognitive map mm. idea from that person at the, in the UK and then put those two together, mm -hmm. yeah. perhaps. She says, um, I lost your audio. Okay, so mm -hmm. can you hear us yeah. now? So the question again? Oh, the, the question was, um, like, did the writing of the, uh, did, did writing the text, did that, uh, did that predate kind of the, the structure, the, the inverted pyramid structure, or did it, you have this notion of the structure uh, like guiding the narrative and then you kind of filled in the narrative to fit the structure. Okay. So Jane, think about that. Did the, you know, what order did you produce this? Was it the writing first, the structure? I know you said last night to me that you picked up that beta version in 1985 and this was produced in 93-ish or, or released in 93. She writes, the structure came first and I filled in the nodes. 
perfect. And you then you um and you'd already written a lot of the pieces, so you're able to kind of fill those nodes in the way you wanted to. And um, I have an, another question for the author. Like, are there any um, pieces, any nodes that are very hard to find? Like, are there any nodes that where you have to follow just one specific, like, angle of approach to find them? Okay, so um, as she's answering that, I want to mention that she said she wrote this in 92. Some of the prose for the nodes was written in 87. So long time no. writing, long time writing. Yes, the St. Augustine quote, I think. She did She did um, agree with that one. She's just catching up with us a little bit from the lab. Mm. Um, so your question, again, was that... Uh, my, my question um, was, are there any, like, kind of, like, like I guess, like, Easter eggs, or are there any, are there any little narrative nodes that are, that are, like, hidden, or that you have, that you can only find them, like, through one... So Jane, one is there any Jane spaces in this piece? <laughs> So just to mention, um, Jane Yellow Eve Douglas is known for finding these orphan spaces oh. in hypertext work. Oh. She was the first to notice this phenomena because artists, these authors are producing these, you know, pretty large hypertext and then creating these tabs and links. Periodically they would forget to connect a, a <laughs> Lexia, a <laughs> node, to something and they would become orphans. And you yeah, yeah, you could click to it, but you couldn't get anywhere else from there. And so they were orphan spaces. And so she named, they, they became known as Jane spaces <laughs> because she found them. Even though, and just another thing is that Jane's name's not really Jane. It's J. Yellow Leaves Douglas, so J. And so people had a hard time understanding what Jane meant, so she made up the name Jane. So people go back and forth between calling her Jane oh, okay. and Yellow Leaves. Um, Let's see if we go back here a second. So she says no to your, your response. Let's see. Watch mm -hmm. this. Get back in first. Um, she says, I did that with afternoon. Michael had forgotten he had written this orphan space, and I called him up to ask him about it. So he wrote it into, the, into afternoon. And then Kathy says, yes, Jane, that's a great anecdote. I read it in Matt, Matt um, Kirschenbaum's mechanism. So that's where it was documented, the Jane space. And she says, no, there's not one. <laughs> Actually, though, Jane, I would, I would argue that that um, no we get to with the period, that there's blank mm. space, that becomes almost, I, when I got there, I thought, oh, my gosh, I've gotten to a Jane space in Jane space. And then mm. I hit return, and I realized I can get to the last, the, you know, the ending, uh, Alexia. Mm. So I thought I had found one when I got to that blank space. Mm. Um, she responds, that's one of the most rare, rarefied nodes. <laughs> Students in the cl my classes, uh, any questions from you guys? I mean, you're playing with these things. You're playing with twine now in my class. You're, you know, you're working in the labs. I mean, any comments from you guys? I'm curious the process of writing the story if it's written out in totality and then segmented into nodes. Okay. That's a great question. Um, Yellow Leaves, we have a question from um, Katie, uh, who wants to know if you created the work first and then divided into nodes. And she's going to be answering that. As she's writing that response, um, Kathy says, so it's like an Easter egg. And then um, Yellow Leaves answers, I wanted to have confirmation that you achieved closure. So that's why the space comes after the blank space, that the denial of language mm. to describe death. Yeah. And I thought, when I saw the period, I thought the punctuation of life, right? The ending of life or the period of your life. Um, she responds, no, I worked in advertising to Easter writing to different and intenser sets. So she wrote in pieces, I'm guessing you're trying to say. You did write in nodal structure in your brain. Some, some authors have, you know, they report that they do this. Um, she says, yes. So it's kind of like um, when we were writing, those of us that came from writing on paper, with paper and pen, and we made the leap into writing on the computer, it, there are a lot of folks who had a hard time making that shift because you can use your hand on a piece of paper in front of you and you can scribble and make notes a certain way. When you move to the computer screen, you couldn't do that. There were other affordances, but you couldn't do the ones you were inculcated with. And, but 
But we noticed when we made, those of us who made those, that change, our brains began to change. I began to think of space as long as opposed to wide or contained even by the frame of a piece of paper. Because if you write in a, in a Microsoft doc, you can scroll forever. The only, the only thing you're contained by is the amount of space you have on the server to hold that piece of paper, so to speak, right? And so your whole notion of space changes, and so when you write for it, you write differently. When you're writing in hypertext, you're writing in little tiny increments. You can't write, I mean, when I read people who write long novels or long essays, you can tell they don't work a lot in electronic because their emails are these long, daunting, <laughs> I mean, Joe Tabby, I love you dearly, but you write the most daunting email messages <laughs> in that there's no paragraphing. There's no, there's no breaks. Whereas those of us who play a lot in hypertext, our hypertextual kinds of writing, we chunk our text. I write one line sentences, some of you know, because it's just easier to read on the eyes. She goes on to say, let me read what she's saying. I did an experiment in 1991 that I documented in my first book where I took a linear story, chopped it up, and then gave it an envelope of fragments to get teams to assemble it. They preferred their invented um, versions to the original. More projection and richness in the inter inter interminency of the chopped up text. And then she says he always did. Yeah, I know Joe is no notorious for the way he writes email messages. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Any other questions from folks in the audience? Well, it's more of a comment. It's like I appreciate the how difficult it must have been to write this story because you have people on a team working together, and it just comes so hard agreeing on what how the direction the story should go. And like the experience of the car crash, like that invokes emotion with me personally because unless you've been in a car crash, you don't know the true feeling of losing someone you love, like the reality and death, and as the author has stated that she has felt that way. Yeah, did you hear that, um, Yellow Leaf? That came from Nathan Wills, a student in my, my class, he's going to be a graduating senior next semester. He was appreciating the, the kind of, uh, the ability for you to, to evoke emotion, in, uh, especially about the car crash, in the work, and the way you produce this work, and, and the, the the kind of writing that you did in this space. Did I capture that correctly? Yeah. yeah. Nicholas asked, was this inspired by William Burroughs' cut-up technique? And he's referring back to, to Yellow Leaf's discussion about chopping up the, the text and putting it in an envelope. And we're waiting for a response to that. And after that, we have time for one more question or comment, and we'll complete this at 1.30ish. So, that's great. Any other questions? One more? So she says, um, Noah is exploring how we project meaning into gaps between sentences and nodes. And this is something you were talking about last night when we were um, having our conversation about how there's not been a lot of work to really look at these kinds of issues in writing. And this is something she's very interested in. Nicholas says thank you. Yeah, um, and just one kind of uh, comment, it doesn't need to be the final one, but um, regarding what Yellow Reese wrote a moment ago about um, authors working in, in teams and to kind of reassemble the fragments, and they felt like there was more, they preferred their own reconstructions or their own versions of the story because they were able to project more. I think that it's, um, I mean, it's very interesting for a text that's explicitly dealing with, with trauma and mourning. I mean, this, this notion of, uh, of being able to kind of project your own, you know, like you, like different people, as you said, are going to, uh, different aspects of the narrative are really going to resonate them when, with them in different ways and different things are going to kind of jump out. So I think that um, in a lot of ways, maybe having this fragmented narrative could be especially mm -hmm. um, productive of meeting, you know, when it comes to trauma and mourning and kind of, you know, a lot of times I think as a literature professor, you know, we discuss a lot that in class we use narrative to help us give uh, kind of a coherent and understandable shape to kind of all these different events of our life. And so I think that this is a particularly interesting example of um, a narrative that both kind of calls that into question because you, you're, you're faced with those fragments and, and what feels very incoherent on the face of it, but we have this very human desire to kind of make it make sense, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's within the narrative or kind of within our own lives. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting when you read it, when you read it through, like, and you come across just the one death, and then you think, okay, well, I saw we had one car crash, one death, and then you go back and read it again, and you come across the second one, and it's like that is that the same one? Is it a different yeah, one? Yeah. And it helps to, um, and when you realize it's two different car crashes, two different deaths, it add, it, it it weighs, it gives gravity to that work in a really significant mm -hmm. way. At the same time, you can it. it it, you're confused. You're coming. Yeah, it calls into question. Yeah, yeah, like what you thought you understood before. You're like, wait, do I understand or did I understand? But yeah, and it's kind of like mm -hmm. what happens in real life, right? Mm -hmm. We we're talking to someone, we get a piece of information, and it's like, wait a minute, is that the same event? Was that a different event? And you start. You really we don't get facts from start to finish, right? On a regular basis, we're always walking into the bit of conversation, always getting a bit of something and trying to make sense of it. And I think that's what hypertext does so well, right? That's the affordance of hypertext. Is it, it emulates that experience, that very human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. so I was going to say, <laughs> one thing I was going to say, and Jane responds, I like the way, Philippe, that you fix on the meaning of a line about mistaking patterns for order, capital O. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes, Will? Just going back to her, her comment about the gaps in the, in the fragments of hypertext, and it, she, she had written about um, cinema as being an influence. And I don't know what kind of research has been done about hypertext in cinema, but there seems to be that frame segment that butts up against another frame. And I wonder if she That's had a great I wonder if she had comments about that. I know she's written about That's it. That's a great question. Hey Jane, so um, Will Will, who's our cinema expert, he teaches uh, digital cinema here in the program. He um, was asking about your understanding about the way Cinema seems to reflect the same kind of issues with hypertext, where you have frames butting up against other frames, um, which is what hypertext does: is it butts up against other nodes uh, on the monitor, right? And so, how the gaps work in cinema, as opposed to how it may work in hypertext. And he says he's written about this. Um, I'm not familiar with that writing, so I'd love to have the. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I like to have the. The citation for that would be interesting. Um, she says here, I wrote about that in the performance review in an early article circa 1992. So I'll look in that and, and thank you for that citation. We're about out of time. So I want to, first I want to thank you, um, Jane, for being here today. I know you're in the middle of a job right now. You're working. <laughs> and you're taking a break from your, from your work. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your time last night, and thank you for this fabulous work that you've done. And it, it holds up so beautifully well, and um, it's a work of genius. And the writing is so beautiful. I have captured some of the screens, and I'll be posting it on the uh, website so that people can see that. Um, and I want to thank Philippe Braun for coming mm -hmm. today, because he's also he's on family leave with a baby. <laughs> Uh, and his baby was sick yesterday. Yeah, she's sick today. That's sick why it's today. running a little late. Yeah. So um, I'm delighted that you came and Thank came you. across the river yeah. to be here today. Thank you to all the folks in the in the face-to-face -face audience for coming, and thank you for you uh, in the online audience, Kathy and Bailey, and the rest of you that were here. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you at the next traversal, and that's taking place in January, and I'll be posting information about that. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.